Hello and welcome to the latest Manufacturing Management live panel. Uh, my name is Chris Beck. I'm the editor of Manufacturing Management. It's a pleasure to, to see uh, everybody here today and to welcome this panel to explore the uh, circular economy. Um, today's panel is sponsored by uh, SAGE. Um, and we're going, like I said, we're going to be exploring the circular economy, what it means for UK manufacturing uh, as part of a kind of wider sustainability agenda. And I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of, of leading experts here. Um, and I'll get them to introduce themselves properly um, in just a second, but just to, just to kind of give you top line who they are. Um, we've got Rob Sinfield, who is head of product at Sage, our uh, sponsor today. He's joined by Mark Bustard, the CEO of the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre, uh, John Pierce, the CEO of Made in Britain, and last but not least, Professor Gabby Madeiro, a professor at Heriot Watt University and inventor of something called the K-Brick. Um, thanks to you all for joining me today. Rob, if we can start with you, just uh, a quick introduction to who you are and, um, and what it is that Sage do and the kind of role that you can play in helping manufacturers become more uh, sustainable. Uh, thanks, Chris, and uh, thank you for, for hosting us. So my name is Rob Sinfield. I work as VP of product for uh, Sage X3, which is our flagship manufacturing uh, ERP solution. Sage provides accounting, financials, and uh, payroll and people management solutions to around 2 million customers around the globe. Um, we operate in a number of different countries and have uh, a multitude of manufacturers using our solutions across the UK. Um, and myself personally, I've been working with manufacturers in the manufacturing space for 20 plus years. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Mark, we'll come to you next. Hi, I'm Mark Busted. I'm the CEO of uh, iBioIC, as we call it, the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre based in Scotland. Um, we have facilities in Glasgow and, and in Edinburgh as well. Um, so we are really about driving the bioeconomy um, across the UK, uh, but we are measured in terms of economic growth for Scotland. And so um, we are currently delivering the National Plan for Industrial Biotechnology for Scotland, uh, which looks at economic growth, job growth and support for innovation. Thanks. Uh, John, we'll come to you. Certainly. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me today. Uh, my name is John Pierce. I'm the Chief Executive of Made in Britain. Um, we're a relatively new uh, group uh, that brings together uh, 1,700 uh, SME and larger manufacturers. Um, we support them in lots of ways, but the main way that we support them is by providing them with a license to use the Made in Britain mark, which we protect very carefully. Um, and our members uh, use this mark to help them sell more of what they make. Um, my, uh, my knowledge of sustainability really comes from them. Um, my reading on circularity and sustainability has been um, really deep in the past four years. I started to look at this uh, properly um, four years ago, I was introduced to it by our chairman, Chris Harrop. Um, and, and we really have quite a strong story to tell in, in what the members are already doing. And uh, it's, it's something that we're, we're trying to uh, give the members visibility around what they're trying to achieve in circularity and sustainability already. Great. Uh, and they, they do use our network as a peer-to-peer -peer learning system as well. So that's an opportunity to share best practice uh, between the members. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Uh, and finally, um, Gabby, very excited to hear from you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate of this uh, panel today. It's an interesting topic. I'm excited to hear more about it. I'm a professor from Heriot Watt University, and I'm a co-founder of uh, Kenotech, that is spin-out uh, company from Heriot Watt. And what we produce in Kenotech is the K-brick that I have developed uh, in Heriot Watt, that is a brick made of over 90% recycled waste from construction demolition. So is a circular approach into construction that it needs so much. and uh, well, we need to change how we're doing, and we have been seeing things uh, over the past years uh, uh, that uh, have been initiated, but because of the really um, bad uh, story that construction have been saying in terms of uh, carbon emissions, 39% of the carbon emissions uh, are coming from construction demolition, production of waste is more than ever, uh, there is a 
is the time for us to think differently and to find for different solutions. So we are hoping to be helping with that with the K Brick. Thanks, Gabby. Um, we'll, we'll kind of start with a with a kind of open discussion, I suppose, on on what the what the circular economy means. Um, it's it's a phrase that I think has really uh, gained traction in the last uh, last eighteen months, maybe two years. Um, people are beginning to kind of understand it, but maybe not from a from a kind of industrial perspective. Um, I, I don't know who wants to start. Rob, we'll come to you first, I suppose. What what does the circular economy mean? Uh, mean to you and then um, anybody else who wants to, wants to chip in more than well. Yeah, I think the circular economy is an interesting concept. Um, if you think of the way that we used to talk about the, the, the manufacturing space or the economy in general, it was very much linear. You take, you'd make, you dispose. With a circular economy, it's about introducing this idea of, of really creating a circular environment and introducing the four R's it's about reduction, reusing things, recycling things, and removing uh, carbon and inefficiencies from the process. So that's at a very high level. For manufacturers, it's about making sure that you can optimize your processes so that you can, again, reduce waste. You can reuse componentry that, that you would otherwise have thrown away. So co-products and byproducts become really essential in this space. Um, it's about how you recycle. Uh, uh, capability. So instead of disposing of an old machine, if you're in an industrial space, bringing it back in, breaking it down into the components, servicing those components, and then delivering them back um, as spare parts or a refurbished set of capabilities going forward. And then obviously removal of any sorts of efficiencies throughout the process um, comes down to not just looking at, at um, yeah, we're going to remove carbon by sourcing from a, a, a local supplier, but it becomes about removing any inefficiencies that you may have. So identifying if a machine is not performing optimally, servicing that machine so you get the optimal energy consumption, et cetera. But I'm sure, I'm sure Mark and, and, and the rest of the panel have some ideas around this as well. Yes, by all means. I mean, uh, Mark will come to you. Uh, you've been called out by Rob there. Um, what, what does the circular economy mean to you? And indeed, the, the bioeconomy, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, Rob's certainly set it out, you know, in terms of the basic principles of, of circularism. I mean, you often see um, diagrams based on two main components within circularism, which is around and renewables or materials that can be regenerated versus finite materials and how we manage those two aspects of circularism and you've got good examples of, of people you know involved in that here today certainly from our perspective we're about um, looking at um, you know alternative ways that we can produce the chemicals and the energy that we need um, and reduce our reliance on the petrochemical industry uh, and fossil fuels ultimately um, we see great examples of this in, in cultures across other parts of the world, and it is growing in enthusiasm. And ultimately, you know, we're talking about manufacturing today. Um, you know, it's manufacturing that's critical, you know, to the GVA of, of the UK. Um, and also, um, I think many of the manufacturing subsectors, if you like, um, are really trying to get to grips with this and uh, a lot of effort and work has been put in and it's great to see but we need we need a strong push I think you know to help manufacturing companies embrace this and and you know make that switch to circularism so I would suggest maybe um, maybe some of the other speakers may have um, some insight into that as well. Well absolutely John that, that sounds like the perfect perfect chance for you to come in there. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think for me, circularity is is a new way to to think. <laughs> you know, that's what it, it it feels to me. You know, personally, I, I have taken it quite personally as a way to um, to think about things, and, and that's uh, introduced me to the idea of of systems thinking rather than uh, economy thinking. I, I think the circular economy is uh, slightly uh, paradoxical uh, because. Um, really, circularity, uh, the evidence that we've seen from members that are having a go 
at doing this, um, what they're really addressing is, is the fact, that, you know, the, this urgency that we have around the fact that, you know, resources are finite um, and, and the population's growing and that we need to make things and, and grow food, you know, to provide the very basics for people. And that, you know, that system as it is at the moment, as, as, um, as Rob so beautifully defined, that linear systems thinking uh, isn't going to serve us for the future. And I think uh, for me, uh, th there are all sorts of debates around, you know, what the circular economy will look like. But I think the, the, the focus really and the, and the usefulness of, of referring to the circular economy is that we're, we're mainstreaming the idea that we have to be circular in everything we do. You know, if you're putting out your rubbish uh, and you're wondering where it goes, <laughs> then, you know, that, that, that is systems thinking and it's circular thinking because, you know, some of that rubbish, uh, you know, might end up being burned in another country. It might end up on a landfill. You know, we're all wondering what on earth happens to the things that we discard. And, you know, from, from a very personal point of view, you know, representing the members that we do, you know, these, these businesses that are manufacturing um, have, you know, they are right at the very sharp end of, the, of this uh, challenge. You know, the, the net zero challenge is, is obviously a, a, about energy and emissions, but, you know, resource scarcity is, is an even more profound existential, existential challenge to, to business than that, um, you know, and, and we've all seen, you know, how much uh, the, the availability and the price of, of raw materials is, is going up and fluctuating all the time. You know, I, I think the circular economy really and, and circular thinking is a way for us to address, you know, these urgent challenges of, of resource scarcity so that we're all, uh, all thinking the same way rather than thinking, you know, the, the linear way, which, uh, which we've already decided and analyzed and, and realized that that just won't, uh, it won't help us with, uh, with the future that we want for everyone. Absolutely. That was a very, a very passionate speech there, John. Gabby, I'll come to you. Um, John touched on quite a lot, of, a lot of things there, and indeed Rob and Mark have as well. Um, obviously, you're, you're someone who's kind of practicing, uh, you know, the, the product you're, you're making, and indeed you've recently received um, a significant amount of funding for, um, I think. You know, your, your product is going, to, is going to make a difference. What, what does circularity mean uh, for a company, you know, an organisation like Kenatech? For us, well, through the development of the K-Brick, we had this circular concept many years ago, more than 10 years ago, before even we were discussing so much and had uh, put a name to it. We were looking how we could be more resource efficient. So what John was uh, mentioning, we, we were worried that uh, as a sector construction is exploiting so much natural resources without thinking that, uh, okay, they are going to end and we are at the same time taking, taking, exploiting that and producing so much waste. One third of the waste that is produced in the UK is coming from construction. So it's, it's too high the numbers and there is precious waste in that. So the concept that we had and is, uh, had, have been the rationale of our development and is part of our ethos was how can we add value to this waste in, and make this uh, as recycled waste, the feedstock for a new building material. So with that in mind, we developed the K-Brick. So we take construction demolition waste, we recycle that. And that, uh, so is a circular approach that it comes that uh, waste is taking from site, it goes to a recycling plant, it is recycled. Next door, and I'm saying next door because we want to reduce carbon emissions. We're very aware of movement of materials and we want to be as uh, sustainable as possible. Next door, we then manufacture the K-brick that goes back to site in this closed loop in the sense that a zero waste process because uh, we don't produce any waste. We're using that. And if something at the end of the process there, it doesn't pass our final uh, product uh, protocol checks, we just take that and put this uh, in the start of the process. So it's a zero waste uh, process. And it's also thinking long term because I think the circular economy, we need to reach the point now that we're not thinking just today. Let's say uh, Mark says, I want to build a green building. So we produce green bricks. We're producing <laughs> recently some green bricks. So that came to my mind. 
and we make the well, we build this uh, green building. And then 60 years from now, uh, Rob says, look, let's put this down. I need a blue building. So we put that down, we recycle that, and we use this as feedstock for producing new K bricks, then blue, go back. So it's not just thinking today, is what John was saying is a long-term thing, what we're doing with our materials, but we have a responsibility in our choices that we're thinking something that it has this closed loop circular approach that long-term we're not doing damage, we are helping things. So this is the K-brick, is a, a material that is uh, made, is a building material made of over 90% recycled content with this closed loop and very important for us with the construction the background, we didn't want to have cement in the mixture because of the carbon emissions. Uh, and we didn't want to have the high temperatures of firing clay bricks that is over a thousand degrees Celsius. So with that, with a combination of what we put and how we put, we don't have firing and we managed to reduce to one tenth of the carbon emissions because circularity it comes also in the responsibility in terms of resource efficiency the energy that is demanded, the carbon footprint, and in each step of the process, can I have a small circular process that I can reduce? This is what we have been doing. And we are very happy to see how, well, how much appetite there is from the market and how ready it is to get a product like ours. So it's good to see that to, it's not only that there is the pressure in terms of legislation and targets from the government, but it's also that the market, the, the people are ready for it. So we need to have more products like the K-Brick there to, to think uh, and to help a path for a more sustainable future. Absolutely. I think, you know, one thing you said there, Gabby, that, that kind of summed up, I think what everyone was trying to say was, was adding value to waste. Um, what, you know, waste is something that manufacturers in particular are very conscious of, whether that's, you know, the, the waste byproducts of, of what they're making or you know the processes themselves cutting step stages out and becoming more lean so waste is very much in in the mindset of of manufacturers and i think adding value to that is, is basically um the the overall purpose of the circular economy mark i'm going to come to you for, for a second here um gabby was talking there a lot about um you know um, re reusing waste from construction, but but what um, I bio I see are trying to do is kind of a more organic, literally organic approach. Um, how how does the bioeconomy work, and 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 what kind of manufacturing um, possibilities are there, if you like, with with some of the, the the research and the work that you're doing? I think um, it's a great opportunity for the UK to grow, you know, a new a new industry um, critically to grow next generation manufacturing you know industrial biotechnology takes fantastic science but it's about how it becomes scalable to actually have impact so you know we have over 120 member organizations probably 80 percent of those are micro and sme companies working on like gabby fantastic science but it's how do you get it to scale and how do you get it to have an impact now we also follow that philosophy in many of our companies that we support um, and their innovation journey is about taking waste and getting high value products from that. Um, one of the challenges you do face, though, is actually getting a grip on what the waste is, what the composition is, where it is and how you're going to actually gather waste together unless you've got a very, very significant supply of a particular waste. So. We have organizations working on converting shellfish waste to you know, um, film packaging. We've got people taking coffee grounds from major um, coffee houses and turning them into um, agricultural organic fertilizer. We have all sorts of people working on eggshell waste, turning it into biomaterials. You know, it, it, what is capable, what is, what is actually happening based on science and innovation is, is fantastic. But critically, what we need to do is, is understand where the waste sits, how we collect that, because we don't want to contribute to the carbon footprint by driving all over the UK or shipping tanker loads of things in from around the world. We need to look at local supply chains and indigenous supply chains and then think about how we can convert those 
into high value processes and products at a scale that really benefits grub, you know, job growth, economic growth, and can have a significant impact in terms of carbon abatement and environmental impact. So that's what we're driving, but I would underline the importance of getting this to scale. Um, science is fantastic, and the, the research that goes on around the UK is second to none in some of these areas, but how you get it to scale and get it accepted within the culture of the UK um, is important. We've seen it in the Nordics, you know, looking at sharing best practice. It's part of their life, you know, in, in the Nordics, they embrace the whole reduction of environmental impact and green processes. And we need to get to that point too. So that's our campaign, that's our challenge. But um, the science comes first, then manufacturing growth. And then after that, you know, let's see what we've got in terms of new supply chain opportunities. Absolutely. John and, and Rob, um, if you've got anything you'd you'd like to add to what uh, Mark or indeed Gabby have, uh, have said I think, there. Um, yeah, all, all I'd say on, on that is, is here, here. I mean, um, if there's one thing I know for sure about circularity is that you can't you can't be circular by yourself. I think this is this is coming through, you know, with, with academics that are studying circularity and businesses that know that they need to be circular. There's a very uh, early recognition from anyone uh, investigating this world of circularity, let's call it, um, that you can't do it by yourself. And so, you know, we all need to be thinking about how we can make it easier for uh, businesses to collaborate with, you know, local businesses that they they're aware of, um, and and perhaps some less than local businesses that they're not aware of. And um, one of, one of the ways that we try to do this at Made in Britain is um, is giving our, our members the platform. Um, we we've, we've set up a something called a green growth uh, survey, which will lead to a, a program for our members where they are essentially declaring where they're at in their, in their green journey, in their sustainability journey. Uh, and part of that survey is, is around asking them what their circularity um, impacts are so far and, and asking some of the key questions around what materials they, they're expecting to be short of and what waste materials they're having to get rid of in, in whatever way that is. And this is really part of, of platforming the idea of circularity and normalizing it across our membership. Um, so that we can present you know, dashboards and, and maps of, of where these businesses are and who they need to be in touch with, you know, to, to alleviate their, their waste problems. Because I think the, um, the other given in all of this is that you can't handle all, your, all of your own waste yourself and you can't take in just one raw material to make a product. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Gar Gabby would agree, you know, it's pretty, pretty much every product that is made uh, in, in this country that I've seen from our members is, is made up with a sophisticated combination of raw materials, uh, skilled, meaningfully employed people, uh, a premises, you know, there's a lot of different in ingredients and um, understanding where all those uh, components of the manufacturing process are coming from um, is, is really key to, to setting up a circular system to, to cope with the waste uh, that, that sometimes you won't be able to take that back to factory. Absolutely. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I can build on that, I, I... There, there's been some really interesting points here. The key about circularity is it's a paradigm shift. It is a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that we think about things, in the way that we view manufacturing, supply chains. No longer should we be focusing on supply chains. We should be talking about value chains. Where are we extracting value from the chain that we're working with? Is it through uh, innovative processes that are being delivered? But I, I think there's a couple of other things that people need to be aware of and, and businesses out there need to be conscious of this. Adoption of the circular economy is not something that's gonna be for free. It, there's a startup cost required. It's like any major initiative, digital transformation, industry 4.0, lean manufacturing, whatever route you wanna go and however you really talk about these things, because lean is really just a, it, it's a variation of circularity um, in that it's, it's all about reducing inefficiencies. Now, there is a startup cost to that. For consumers, there's likely to be an increased cost while we ramp up and get more efficient because the science is great. We can, we can do a whole bunch of stuff with science, but it's the manufacturers that need to transition. They need to change. They need to evolve. 
but it's not just manufacturing on its own and it's not on the consumers. I wanna bring in the element of government. Government has a responsibility to incentivize organizations doing this. There are these, these programs that have been put in place to be carbon uh, zero by 2035 and 2050, and the government's talking about moving those dates forward significantly. Why are they not uh, supporting small businesses in the UK with innovation funds? Why are they not supporting uh, businesses in the UK to drive the UK as the circular economy, a hub of the world? Why are we not seeing uh, more businesses in the UK take advantage of carbon credits and being carbon neutral or being carbon uh, positive? Um, it's those sorts of things that, that I think we need to be addressing because for me, a lot of the manufacturers I talk to are transitioning already. They're thinking about it. They're doing it. Where are the programs to support those businesses to be more innovative? We have so much innovation taking place in the UK, and I'll climb off my soapbox in a moment, but UK manufacturing is outstanding. I lived in the Nordics for 18 years. I can tell you, yes, they are doing a lot of things, but the innovation is no better than what it is in the UK. In fact, UK manufacturing is the benchmark. We set the tone for innovation across the, uh, for, across the globe. And we're just not driving that enough. There's not enough support for it. So I, I, can, see, I can see that there are a few folks that want to chime in, but I'll, I'll climb off my soapbox for now. It's just one of those things I'm so incredibly passionate about. No, I think you made some very good points there, Rob. And, and John, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that? Well, well, it's just something really around, uh, around, the, around the funding and, um, and sort of just to try and draw a line between the two sciences. You know, the, the science of, of uh, you know, physical sciences are, are one thing. And, and we certainly need, uh, you know, lots of innovation in this, in this space to work out, you know, how to manage our materials more efficiently but I would like to just give some emphasis as well to the social science you know the, the social science of, of what our members are doing um, is, is really you know thinking differently uh, and and there I think as business leadership what we're really trying to do and this might be why governments struggle to to fund this uh, behavior change is because um, it's so much easier to to fund, uh, you know, with with values of, of money, whereas you know the values of of thinking differently and behavioural change, as we've seen with the pandemic, it, it, it's quite hard to manage people's behaviour change in the way that you need to, you know, to solve a problem that you've got. And you know, if we look at resource scarcity as the elephant in the room in in this debate, you know, part of the solutions are coming through with uh, with businesses collaborating differently, thinking differently, and and, and behaving differently in the way they run their business and and and, and that is, doesn't really need uh, you know funding from government or anywhere else it actually needs you know dissemination of, of best practice uh, it needs collaborative behaviors being emphasized and encouraged uh, and it needs uh, you know the sort of uh, the recognition really across all of manufacturing that um this is something that, that it is a problem that they can solve because they have the capacity um, and, you know, as I always say, let's face it, you know, we, we, we sort of generated this problem in the first place. So I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we can work out how to solve it, uh, it you know, because, because that's the capacity that we already have. Can Absolutely. I add, yeah, um, uh, because I'm listening and I really like to hear what I'm hearing from Rob and from John now in this need and I think uh, Rob made a point that is yes we need to have more incentives to make it happen because there's a price to change the way we're doing things and I wonder with what we're discussing here and have there's something that uh, uh, for some time through research and uh, working on this uh, I question is uh, while we have been seeing that uh, many things have been changed when legislation is pushing and there is a drive then that companies uh, need to adapt and then suddenly we see big changes happening and i wonder if it's not time for us to start thinking legislation in terms of use of natural resources because if we have a legislation that is going to start controlling and maybe taxing or whatever is the the most appropriate or putting limits in uses of uh, natural raw materials uh, we can then start having a shift from the, the way things are done, from the linear 
manufacturing exploitation processes, because then people will see that there is a need out there that they will need to develop something uh, considering what is the value of the, the supply chains. And it's uh, these value chains that so far we haven't considered, we just think is a waste, okay, is a waste there, or is a, so we look in, in a different way. So I think uh, maybe the way, the only way that we can have uh, an impact fast enough that uh, will help the environment is to have legislation on that. And this is, uh, will need to come from the government, well, we need to be pushing that. Uh, and there is enough evidence now that is a question of time that we are, we we'll have a big problem if we continue exploiting these natural resources. So mm. I think uh, I agree with Rob that uh, we need to have uh, funds for, but it's not only the funds to make possible, but it's also maybe we need to have uh, another push that it comes from legislation to stop uh, the way we're doing things without thinking on the environment and just continuing the, the, thing, the processes. Absolutely, Mark. Is there anything you'd like to add to, to what anybody said so far? I think, it, I think it's been well covered. I mean, we sit in the middle, so we work across academia, business and government. And obviously there are some things we deal with uh, Westminster on UK wide activities, but uh, at a local level, sitting within Scotland, we certainly speak with Scottish government um, very frequently and they're very keen to look at um, the development of new supply chains. And so there is some work that's undergoing, uh, is underway at the moment, um, being driven uh, by the government to look at that. And I would, I would hope, and, I, and we will do all we can to make sure that you know, circularism is built into that, you know, and we, we take that into account. One of the comments I would make in, in a bit like Rob felt he needs to get on his soapbox, um, for me as well, every meeting where we go into different groups and we're talking about um, circularism, new supply chains, um, you know, carbon abatement, the, the entire focus seems to be just on decarbonizing energy and not about decarbonizing the energy using industries. Um, so we're quite happy to say that, you know, the answer to all of this is more offshore wind and wave and who knows, we might get to, to hydrogen if we can do all that successfully. And yes, I mean, that is a vision, but what happens to the rest of, of the manufacturing sector across Scotland? And what happens to the rest of the supply chains? You know, we, we all need to move in this direction. Um, and so that's, that's my soapbox, but uh, you know, think a bit further down the line other than just energy generation. You know, think about what the implications are for building in circularism across all manufacturing sectors. And where are we as consumers getting all of our products um, that we will want, no matter whether they're coming from, you know, around the world or petrochemicals or whatever. And um, the first, the first challenge you face is when you start to take products away from consumers, because then you hear, um, you know, about issues there. Whereas I think now culture is changing where people appreciate we need to be much more considerate about where we obtain, you know, these these sorts of products and how they're made. So. Um, you only need to look at the next generation coming through. A lot of the kids now that are that are out there are much more aware of environmental impact, and they have a different stance on it than maybe those of us that were that grew up in the seventies, where man-made fibers and and poly bags were thought to be, you know, cutting edge. And actually, you know, we've contributed quite significantly to the overall problem. Um, but in those days, it, it, it was fantastic, you know, solution to, to issues that we were facing. Now we realise it wasn't. So, you know, there's there's hope in the next generation as well. But it's it's up to us to drive it, though. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Chris. Bro, Chris yeah. One thing I, I wanted to just add to that is that yes, we talk about decarbonisation, and I I, I I I just want to touch on this because. We're seeing this huge drive to everybody transitioning to eco-friendly cars and environmentally friendly cars that are low or no emissions, um, the, the Teslas and what have you of the world. 
what nobody's talking about is the the, the, the raw materials that go into the manufacturing of the batteries are more carbon intensive than the actual um, engines themselves that are internal combustion engines. So we, we're, we're seeing a shift in the emphasis and we're just pushing it further down the supply chain. And that's, that's the, the, I think that's what John was trying to get to as well is that just because you move it from one point in the supply chain to another doesn't mean you alleviate the problem. You've actually got to, as an entire supply chain, come together and create circularity within that supply chain. Um, local farmers working with local um, retailers and wholesalers, etc. It's this whole idea of local um, mm. and a, a shift in um, sustainable sourcing and sensible sourcing and things like that. It has to be at the forefront of what we're trying to do here as well. I, I completely agree, Rob, and I, I think one of the takeaways from from some of the reading, I, I read a book which uh, some of you may uh, um, some of you may have read called the Donut uh, Economy, uh, the Donut um, uh, Donut Economics, or anyway, book by Kate Rayworth um, that describes uh, sort of early uh, explanations of, of why we need a circular economy and. Um, one of the takeaways is, is that we don't, the economists at the moment, I think, don't really have the appropriate measures to, to really give us, uh, you know, a, a circularity, a circular economy score. Um, and I think this is, this is what we need to establish urgently is, you know, a sort of fair way to compare, you know, how circular a business is. Because, you know, if you're looking at, at just the, you know, the, the traditional ESG measures, um, environmental, social governance, um, that doesn't really cover, you know, this this resource scarcity problem. And I, I do like to think that you know we're we're getting to a point where the economists uh, will agree that that we need some some new ways to measure circularity, uh, and that the sooner we have those, the better, because then we can actually give a fair comparison of of what a successful circular business is. You know, we we've got some some businesses that are on uh, that are able to prove that they're already using 100 um, percent upcycled materials I, I think gabby you're at 90 and i'm sure the aim is to get to 100 we've got members uh, of made in britain that are, are have always been committed to receiving every product that they've ever made back to their factory so that's a sort of 100 percent responsibility score if you like and then we've got some that are that are trying desperately to make sure that that 100 percent of the input materials for their product no matter how complex it is um, you know, are actually sourced, you know, within within a, a local distance, so a sort of proximity scoring, if you like. Uh, but these aren't the kind of uh, measures that you see in in traditional economics, and I think that's um, one of the one of the conclusions. My conclusions is about the circular economy is that we aren't quite ready to measure it properly, uh, and that we need to the economists need to really work a bit harder on that. Uh, you know, to make sure we're we're able to compare and contrast successful companies through the circular lens absolutely yeah um you know we've, we've talked a lot about why circularity is a good thing and and you know whether support should be coming from from government or or wherever and and how the next generation you know are, are, are more um eco-conscious than, than maybe some previous generations were but if you're a manufacturer watching this and and you've got a relatively complex supply chain that you know spans a few different countries and you're trying to be sustainable and you kind of you know you you think you're on the path to it but you don't know where to start with with circularity and, and kind of un, you know understanding what waste you can reuse and, and where to go for that i'd like to hear the, the panel's thoughts really about if you are at day one of your circularity journey obviously you know someone like gabby wakes up in the morning and says or you know 10 years ago and says i want to make a a, a fully circular circular economy uh, model for for bricks but but if you're a company that has a well-established supply chain and has been around for several years and everything else um where where can someone you know like them start uh, gabby we'll, we'll start with you actually yeah i can start so this is a question that i'm asked quite often actually and uh, one thing companies come a bit uh, asking for help and uh, sometimes um, 
we have a like a, our brink has a big circular approach, but within a big process, there are lots of ways that you can introduce circular approaches in different stages, in different steps. And to start with, you don't need to change how you do things drastically, but you can reassess all the different processes that you have in your manufacturing, in your uh, company through, and you can see if you can localize in this different stage, introduce circular go for something drastic that can be then changing the whole process, but you can have this and this will be the first step for something bigger because there's uh, open paths for looking things in a different way, changing supply, uh, how you're looking your, your supply change, changing the way you are um, thinking in terms of materials. So I would say things is small, but understand carefully your process and look again at your process with different eyes of saying, how can I introduce circularity at different levels, at different stages, and start small with this and concentrate to make that work. Once that works, it will open for sure the path for other opportunities. Uh, Mark, actually, I'll come to you next, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I would use the example of one of the companies we work with, which is um, Unilever. You know, Unilever took a very strong stance, you know, saying that they would re remove um, their reliance on petrochemical derived substances for their cleaning and detergents business by 2030. So that ultimately creates a ripple through their entire supply chain. And so... Um, you know, those suppliers into the, the large multinationals, that drives their change in culture as well, if they want to continue to do business, you know, with the large end users. So what you need are some of the bigger end users stepping up to the plate and, you know, committing to some of these sorts of agendas, which then ultimately forces the rest of the supply chain to, to create a shift in culture there as well, potentially. The, the other side of it is around... There are organizations who can help, obviously. So, um, you know, you can start small, as Gabby says, do your analysis. But um, also, it's a case of um, thinking about what waste streams and what potential value streams you might have. And that might need some uh, an organization like ours or others to come in who have a good knowledge of what is possible with some of those substances. So I would say extend your network, you know, and use the people that have expertise. I've always found people working in this space to be very open uh, to sharing and, and actually very critical about their own performance in this. Um, and so people are willing to get to grips with this and share best practice. And I think, you know, um, we've heard some of that earlier today. So start small. Think, uh, think smart and then work out how you're going to um, drive the change across your supply chain, really. Absolutely. John, um, I'll, I'll come to you. Yeah, I think, um, well, I, I always say this, read. <laughs> You've got to read a lot in this space. Um, and if you don't know much about circularity, I suggest anyone would uh, have a look at Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website. It is brilliant. Um, it is, it, I think it's been up there for 10 years, Gabby, you might know if it's been up there longer than that, but Ella MacArthur has been an extraordinary champion of this for many years. And um, not only has, has the foundation promoted the idea of circularity, but they've really put some analysis behind, you know, what, what are the key concepts here? You know, the, as uh, we were talking earlier about linear versus circular, you know, all of that is explained really clearly on Ella MacArthur's uh, website. Uh, and I would say it's a it's a great starting point. You know, if, if you're a novice in this world of circularity, then have a look there. Um, there is also, you know, networking. I think uh, we're all agreed that you can't be circular by yourself. Um, you need to be in networks. There are networks all over the place. Um, but by, you know, joining a few new networks, perhaps diversifying your business contacts, uh, you might uh, discover some some new uh, advice. And there is lots and lots of free advice out there. You know, if you look on the UN Global Compact, uh, they have reams of material uh, on, on circularity. They're, they're focused around all of the, uh, the sustainable development goals, obviously, but they are very keen on, on sharing what they know. And, and lots of other, you know, government websites 
as well that will give you some tips as to how to how to approach this subject from a business point of view. But I, I would just say that I, I'm extremely optimistic that, that manufacturers will be able to crack this nut because um, you know, manufacturers are great collaborators by nature. You know, all of our members, uh, all 1,700 of them are, are manufacturing something in, in Britain. Um, and they prove to me every, every week of the month and every month of the year that they know how to collaborate. And that is essentially the social science skill that you need, uh, you know, to, to make this actually work. Um, and I'm, I'm very confident that they can. And, and, you know, businesses of all sizes can really join in with this because it is, it's an exciting time as well as a, a challenging one. It's a really exciting time to be in this space. Uh, and manufacturers obviously have a, a key responsibility in it. Great. And, and Rob, I, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So the, this is going to have to be the final word for you. But, uh, you know, feel free to, to share your advice on where, where you think manufacturers can, can start there. Well, I think I think journey. I think uh, I think John and Mark and Gabby have really summarized it really well. Read, research, start small, look at incremental gains. It doesn't have to be a fundamental shift from day one that you're all of a sudden now completely circular in everything that you're doing. Um, the other thing that I would do is look at your technology infrastructure because technology does have a part to play here. If you can't identify where there's room for improvements and room for removal of inefficiencies, you need to look at your technology platform as well because it should be providing you with that insight into there are operational inefficiencies here or we could make incremental gains. The other thing is you need to be able to measure the gains that you're making. If you can't measure them, how do you know that you're actually executing against them? And kind of the final word is, we never thought we would survive COVID and we thought manufacturing was gonna die and it was gonna shut down and it was gonna fall over and we'd all be, we'd all be dead in, in a, number of, uh, a number of weeks because of lockdown and the, the, the tragic situation that we found ourselves in. Manufacturers have adjusted, they've, they've rallied, they've come together, they've transitioned their businesses overnight in some cases, going from making one product to making another product. So the UK manufacturing is not a fuddy-duddy industry. It's a dynamic, evolving industry that is continuing to innovate and demonstrate what it's capable of. So like John, I'm full of optimism that we'll get this right. Um, look into... The, the one sort of thing that I would say is look into what circularity actually means for your business and try and understand it because maybe there are some very small things that you could do that could have massive gains and use it as a way of differentiating in the marketplace. Those businesses that can actually demonstrate this will be able to drive consumers to their products. They'll be able to drive other suppliers to their products. They'll be able to drive the customers to use their products because they will be setting themselves apart from the uh, from the rest of the market. So, if if anybody's concerned about the costs, think of it that way. It gives you a unique selling point in the market. Get ahead of the game and really disrupt the marketplace. Absolutely, I think Rob, that's a that's a very good, a very nice summary. I think, you know, the circular economy is something that um, that manufacturers are, are beginning to get their heads around you know sustainability is is probably topic number if not number one and it's certainly in the top two or three for for many manufacturers and while you know while we said circularity is quite often a new way of thinking i think everyone's really touched on the fact that it quite often it's just rethinking the way that you're currently doing things there will be opportunities there gabby's point about circularity being just adding value to waste that should be kind of a rallying cry for for everyone um, every manufacturer really to kind of understand that there is you know there's more than this altruistic reason for doing it there's a there's a real financial and a real business reason for, for kind of exploring circularity so hopefully this is this has kind of sparked sparked some thoughts with with the audience and, and hopefully sparked sparked thoughts amongst some of the panelists as well but for now um thank you once again um to to john pierce from made in britain uh, Gavin Madeiro from Kenetech and um, Harriet Watt University, uh, Mark Bustard from the IBOIC, and finally to, to Rob Sinfield from our uh, sponsors today, um, Sage. Thank you all for your time and thank you everybody else for watching. And I hope to see you again very soon on a Manufacturing Management Live panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rob. <laughs>